Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to the first uh, CNSI seminar of the year. And uh, we're doing something a little di bit different from our traditional um, research seminars, which is that we're going to talk about um, safe handling and disposal of nanomaterials in academic settings. So this uh, work is the result of a collaborative project, and I'll give you an introduction to the people who are involved in that, um, including um, myself. Um, since I don't have anyone here to introduce me, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Health, and um, my research um, is primarily on nanotoxicology, but I also do some high throughput screening for um, infectious disease um, detection. And um, as I said, this, this talk is really the, the outcome of us trying to um, really integrate some of the information that we've learned from the basic science research within the UCCEIN and working with partners to come up with some guidelines that are useful for researchers in academic settings. So the UCCEIN, um, which I'm referring to, I uh, just want to get my acknowledgments out of the way at the beginning, um, is the University of California Center for Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology. It's a $25 million center funded by the National Science Foundation and the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the goal of which is really to try and understand um, the parameters that influence how nanomaterials behave in the environment and their impacts on environmental systems. And it involves a wide range of different researchers from not only a, a number of different academic institutions across the United States, but internationally as well. The two primary sites are uh, UCLA and uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, but we have strong um, presence at a number of institutions. Okay. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about today is specifically the result of a collaboration that's called the California Nano Safety Consortium of Higher Education. Um, it's a group that came together um, out of a desire to uh, develop some science-based guidance for working with nanomaterials in academic settings. We have uh, representatives from uh, two different government agencies, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, which is the um, branch of the National Institutes of Health that's responsible for basic research related to occupational safety. And then also the California Department of Toxic Substance Control, DTSC, which is a branch of the U.S. Uh, EPA and Cal EPA, um, who also provided funding to bring together this consortium. Uh, and then we also have representational representation of environmental health and safety professionals from a variety of different um, premier academic institutions across the state of California, um, including we have a representative here from uh, UC Irvine. Um, and from the University of California system, we have representatives not only from individual campuses, but also um, from uh, the UC regents as well. And then uh, other big players include Stanford University, um, where Larry Gibbs is um, the, uh, one of the leaders of this group, and Mary Doherty um, was responsible for most of the organizational efforts of bringing people together. So. Um, I wanted to particularly acknowledge the two of them. Um, and then from UCLA uh, myself, and I wanted to acknowledge Khadija Dula, who's a second year doctoral student in our environmental science and engineering program, um, who did a complete analysis of uh, the exposure li literature related to nanoparticles, and also supervised a couple of master students from UC Santa Barbara who did a complete analysis of all the guidance documents that are currently available for safe handling of nanomaterials. So the summary that I'm going to provide to you today and the suggestions in terms of how to safely work with nanomaterials are completely based upon um, their reviews of the literature and the synthesis of those guidance documents. So um, just definitionally, um, the definition that we use and that I will use throughout this talk for engineered nanoparticles are uh, particles that are in the size range between 1 and 100 nanometers. Um, that are intentionally produced and designed to have a specific shape, size, surface properties in chemistry, leading to superior novel characteristics or properties that differ from uh, the bulk properties. 
and we'll talk about a, a variety of different types of nanoparticles. I did want to point out that if you look at the size range of 1 to 100 nanometers, we are in the same size range as a lot of very important biomolecules and even uh, viruses. And that becomes very important when we start talking about their physiological effects and the potential um, risks associated with exposure to these materials. Okay, so um, one thing that I'm going to do, and I think it's the next slide. Nope, sorry, okay. Um, some examples of engineered nanomaterials um, that we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to talk about carbon nanotubes. Um, here I gave us an example, single-walled carbon nanotubes, um, which are carbon-based um, and look kind of like a chicken wire of um, carbon rolled up into a tube. Um, they're used for a variety of applications. They have good tensile properties, but also good um, electrical properties, and so are used in a variety of um, uh, semiconductor applications as well. Silver nanoparticles, which are used for antimicrobial applications. Metal oxides, which we use frequently in the CEIN, um, which are used um, to uh, block UV radiation um, and sunscreens and also in a variety of other applications. And then uh, quantum dots, which are used to, um, again, for their great um, optical properties. Okay, so one thing that most people who are familiar with working with nanomaterials are um, very well aware of is that the reason that we're so excited about them is that they um, have highly variable properties. Um, it's possible to make a broad range of different materials, um, starting with very basic building structures. Um, and by varying the physical and chemical properties and the structures and sizes um, of those materials, you're able to um, very finely tune um, the different properties of the materials that make them useful for different applications. So it's really been the advent of technologies that allow us to synthesize specific materials and to isolate specific materials um, that has really pushed forward this field. And uh, just as some examples of current applications of carbon nanotubes, um, you can see that some really major advances in this field in the last couple of years of being able to produce bulk quantities of these materials um, in very large, for instance, sheets um, and to be able to roll them up um, in addition to making small um, um, knots or um, wires with them um, has really increased the flexibility of how they're used. And so although most people appreciate who work with nanomaterials that uh, the thing that we're interested in them that makes them interesting is that they have these highly variable properties. That's those same highly variable properties that also make them challenging um, to work with from a risk um, perspective as well. And so that's part of what I wanted to talk about today. Okay, so the goals of uh, the presentation today are, um, first I'm going to go through and articulate some of the reasons why environmental health and safety specialists are concerned in particular about the potential health risks of working with engineered nanomaterials. Um, I would like for you to be able to identify activities that would increase your risk of exposure when you're working with engineered nanomaterials by the time you leave. Um, hopefully be able to identify what engineering controls, work practices, and personal protective equipment you could use to lower your risk of exposure um, for those different categories and then hopefully appropriately identify how to dispose of laboratory waste containing engineered nanomaterials. Okay, so first off, why are people worried about hazards associated with working with engineered nanomaterials? I think for everyone who lives in Southern California, the concept that um, the quality of the air that we breathe in has an impact on um, our health is, doesn't come as a huge surprise. Um, many of us ex um, have respiratory problems that are associated with air pollution um, in Southern California. Um, what most people don't realize is that the um, type of health outcomes that you see associated with exposure to air pollution is highly correlated with the amount of particles that are in the nanometer size range. Um, which are referred to as ultrafine particles by people who work on air quality. So 
Um, and also that the type of health outcomes, adverse health outcomes that we see associated with exposure to ultrafine particles, which are typically um, generated um, from automobile exhaust or from other um, point sources of pollution, that those don't only result in respiratory health problems. So they also result in cardiovascular problems and also increased uh, mortality from uh, heart disease as well. So um, people have also studied the impacts of particles that are larger in size. So the fraction of particles that are um, 2.5 micrometers um, or less, which is PM 2.5, or 10 micrometers or less, which is PM 10. Um, but again, the emerging science of looking at ultrafine particles has shown fairly definitively that those are the um, particles that we need to be most concerned about. Okay, so why is it that those nanometer sized particles um, within air pollution are the ones that we're most concerned about? It turns out that those particles are the ones that um, deposit into the smaller branches of the lung and into the air exchange area within the lung. So if you look at on this green curve, the fraction of particles that deposit in uh, the upper respiratory area, um, that you can see that it tends to be the larger particles. So our x-axis here is the aerodynamic diameter or size of the particles, and the y-axis is the percentage of deposition. So we see large deposition in um, the nose and upper respiratory tract when um, you have the large particles. For particles that deposit in the trachea and, um, and the very top part um, of the lungs here, um, those particles, uh, you tend to see that for both micron size particles and also some deposition there with smaller size particles as well. Um, but the last category of deposition is um, ones that uh, deposit into the um, smaller branches of the lung and really do impact um, uh, your respiratory capability. Um, and as you can see, there's a big peak in deposition for particles that are um, about three microns in size, um, but then also really huge increase in deposition in the lower areas once you get down to very, very small particles. Um, and that's a problem not only because those nanometer sized particles tend to get deposited in those regions of the lung, but also because of what they do once they get there. So this is a micrograph um, that comes from um, NIOSH's toxicology team that's done some of the best work on pulmonary toxicology, particularly of carbon nanotubes, but of other materials as well. Um, here, what, what's amazing about this is that you can see this car single carbon nanotube coming out here, piercing the interstitial space um, in this uh, lung of an exposed animal. And what they've seen very consistently for carbon nanotubes is that um, as we see for incidental um, ultrafine particles, that carbon nanotubes uh, generate reactive oxygen species and then result on early onset and persistent fibrosis in animal models, um, which are the, usually the early indicators of um, many different types of lung disease. Um, more recently, um, the NIOSH team has also shown um, aberrant cell division associated with exposure to carbon nanotubes, um, which is a particular concern because of the um, possibility that you might not only have fibrosis resulting um, from exposure to carbon nanotubes, but potential for um, starting um, cancer progression as well. Okay, so, and you may be wondering, so why is it, again, we start thinking about why is it that the particles of that size are such a problem? It really shouldn't come as too much as a, a surprise when you think about the fact that viruses which have evolved, um, particularly respiratory viruses, which have evolved to efficiently um, deposit in the lungs and then um, enter your, your body um, are in that same size regime. So, and then also that uh, the smaller nanoparticles as well are also the size of biological molecules um, that we know have important um, biological impacts. So um, I just showed you the NIOSH data for carbon nanotubes, but I wanted to emphasize that this is part of a growing body of literature for a variety of other types of nanomaterials as well, um, where uh, the, d there's different amounts used for these different materials. Um, different 
studies that have been done in terms of um, what's the potential for um, occupational, consumer, and human risk. Um, a lot of variability in terms of the amount that's known about end of life and environmental risk, which tends to be less. Um, and then different regulatory positions. So I would say the strongest position to date has been for carbon nanotubes by the EPA, um, who have regulated carbon nanotubes under the Toxic Substances Control Act um, and have definitively stated that they do not consider the nanomaterials to be um, equivalent to the bulk material. So they're requiring um, that people um, provide um, notification if they're planning to manufacture large quantities of these and, and provide toxicology data. Um, we see emerging as well um, that there probably will be um, regulatory actions um, relatively soon for titanium dioxide and other metal oxide nanoparticles. And then EPA is already regulating silver nanoparticles under um, FIFRA, which is um, the um, Pesticide and Rodenticide Act, um, because they're people have claimed antimicrobial uh, properties for those, and so they're subject to that regulation. Okay, so as of right now, we don't actually have any regulations concerning exposure to um, engineered nanoparticles. The only thing that we have is for a couple of materials, so for carbon nanotubes and titanium dioxide um, in particular, that we have recommended exposure levels. So these are not um, enforceable the way a, a PEL, a permissible exposure limit, would be from OSHA, which is a regulatory body. They're just recommendations that come out of NIOSH based upon the science that they currently have and the risk assessment that they've performed. However, I think it's important to note that for carbon nanotubes, which is the first um, um, engineered nanomaterial for which there actually has been released a recommended exposure limit from NIOSH, that if you look at um, the recommended exposure limit, it's significantly smaller than for other micron-sized um, particles or for bulk materials with similar chemical compositions. So notice this is seven micrograms per meter cubed as opposed to three milligrams per meter cubed or even 15 milligrams per meter cubed. So recommending significantly lower um, exposures for these engineered nanomaterials based on the differential um, toxicity of the nanomaterial compared to the bulk compound. Um, and I think that's something that um, when I'm talking with toxicologists, I often try and reinforce this. Um, often we get excited if we find that something's toxic because we're interested in the toxicology. Um, but it's important always to compare back to the um, bulk material so you get a sense of not only is this toxic, but is it toxic um, compared to something that's not a nano, nano size material. So you may be wondering, well, what am I supposed to do with a recommended exposure limit because um, I don't have any monitoring equipment in order to um, tell what's going on. So NIOSH has based these recommended exposure limits both upon risk assessment and also upon the detection limit of current instrumentation. Um, and as the detection limit for um, methodologies for detecting carbonaceous nanomaterials decreases, they've been successively lowering this recommended exposure limit. So currently it's not limited by our understanding of the toxicity, it's limited by what they think is feasible in terms of exposure monitoring. The Department of Toxic Substances Control and the University um, of California Office of the President have purchased some monitoring equipment for use across the state. And so if you want someone to come into your laboratory and actually do some exposure monitoring, um, you can arrange for that to, to be done. Um, so in the meantime, what I want to talk about are what are some practices that you can employ um, to make sure that um, you're protecting yourself in the absence of, of knowing um, what's going on. I should also mention that NIOSH has gone into a number of workplace settings and has found um, levels of carbon nanotubes in breathing zones of workers that exceed the recommended exposure limit. So it's not as though this is a um, an unlikely scenario that you might actually have those kind of levels. So from a standard hierarchy of controls approach, which is, um, comes from industrial hygiene, if you're just trying to minimize the amount of risk to the individual who's working in the environment, if you can choose to either eliminate the hazardous substance from your work or substitute a less toxic or less hazardous sub substance, 
um, instead, those are always the things that we recommend doing first. However, I think most of you would recognize that um, in an academic setting where we're actually interested in the nanomaterial itself, saying stop using nanomaterials is probably not a, a valid approach for most of us. Um, so then the question becomes, how would you even choose, like if you were distinguishing between different nanomaterials, how might you choose a less hazardous engineered nanomaterial? Um, and so again, just a sort of um, reminder, the amount of risk is uh, dependent both upon the hazard or the toxicity and upon the likelihood for exposure. So um, if you wanted to choose a less hazardous material, you'd need to look at factors like how do the physical chemical properties correlate with the toxicity or the hazard, and how I me design a material that's um, more safe by design. And I just want to point out that that is, in fact, the um, basic goal of the UCCEIN, which is that we're doing um, studies on a wide variety of levels trying to figure out how to correlate um, st structure with activity for these materials to develop safer by design principles. And one of the ways that we do that is through developing high throughput screening methods that allow us to prioritize testing um, in higher organisms and also to start um, piecing apart those relationships. Okay, but in the meantime, while we're gathering all those data and trying to figure out how to do all those types of studies, how do you minimize your risk um, when elimination or substitution might not be an option? And so then we come down to engineering controls, work practices, and use of personal protective equipment. So the approach that our working group has developed is um, one in which we s state explicitly that we don't currently have enough knowledge about how to predict the hazards associated with specific nanomaterials, and therefore your choice on how to reduce your risk should be based upon exposure potential and reducing the potential for exposure. So we're saying we don't have enough information about the top half of the equation, and so therefore you as a practitioner should work focus on steps that you can take in the bottom half on the exposure area. And so what we've done is to categorize um, working different uh, types of experiments with nanomaterials into three different exposure potential categories. Um, a low exposure potential, moderate, and high exposure. And these are reflected on that sheet that you have. Um, and we've tried to make it fairly straightforward for you to figure out wh which category your experiment falls into. So um, which category it falls into is a function of both the um, material state and the conditions of use. And we've also given you some um, handling examples. So I think this is, let's see if I have this in. So, okay, so for category one, for the low exposure potential, um, our hope is that most people are actually working within this category. And what you'll see is that the recommendations for engineering controls, personal protective equipment, and work practices for this category actually correlate with the basic recommendations for good chemical hygiene practices, so standard laboratory procedures. So um, when would you be, would, when would we consider you to be in a low exposure potential? If you're working with materials that are bound in a substrate or a matrix, so they're un, you're unlikely to inhale them. If they're in a water-based liquid suspension or a gel, and you're not engaging in any activity that has a potential for release of engineered nanomaterials into the air, and you're not exposing them to any thermal or mechanical stress. So some examples, non-destructive handling of solid engineered nanoparticles nanoparticle composites or nanoparticles permanently bonded into a substrate. These we consider to be really low risk. Category two, the moderate exposure potential, is when you start using um, engineered nanomaterials in, under conditions where um, there's a potential for inhalation. So um, in this case, it would be engineered nanomaterials as powders or pellets. If you're using a solvent-based liquid suspension, so non-aqueous, but um, organic solvent instead, um, if something that you're doing agitates the materials and causes potential release of them into the air, um, or you're using a thermal or mechanical stress. So examples would be pouring, heating, or mixing liquid suspensions. For instance, pipetting is a really good way to aspirate materials and get them airborne. Um, or operations where you have a high degree of agitation involved, like sonication. Weighing or transferring powders or pellets, or doing bedding changes out of lab laboratory animal cages. What we consider to be category three or high exposure potential 
are if you have engineered nanomaterial suspended in a gas, or if there's an extreme potential for a release into the air. Um, so anything that you're doing that really um, is putting the engineered nanomaterials into the gas phase or into an aerosol form, which would include furnace operations, cleaning a reactor, um, cleaning of dust collection systems used to capture those materials, or high-speed abrading and grinding of composites. Okay, so what should you be doing? If you're working with at a low risk for exposure, um, we do still recommend that you work, if you have open containers, to work with them in a laboratory type fume hood or biosafety cabinet, but certainly if they're closed, um, there's not any reason to believe that they shouldn't be safe out on the bench. Again, standard work practices, you would store in a sealed container with secondary containment. Um, you, as always, need to lab label the chemical container um, and identify the content, and we do ex ex um, recommend that you include the term nano in the descriptor, so you wouldn't just put titanium dioxide, you put nano titanium dioxide, and the same thing applies to waste as well. Line your workspace with absorbent materials, um, which can then be removed so that you don't worry about um, cross-contamination, and of course, use secondary containment when you're transferring materials from one laboratory to the next. Um, in terms of uh, work practices, clean all surfaces, but you should use it, do that using wet, wet wiping methods. So don't like use a, a regular vacuum. If you're going to vacuum something, it needs to be a HEPA filtered vacuum so you're not aerosolizing those materials. Do not dry sweep or use compressed air. So we've seen bad examples of people using compressed air to clean off spaces. That's a good way to aerosolize the materials and increase your risk of exposure. And then dispose of those used cleaning materials in accordance with hazardous waste procedures. And again, label them with the type of nanomaterials present. In terms of PPE, standard PPE recommendations, which are um, safety glasses with side shields and appropriate disposable gloves. And the, so disposable gloves you need to take into consideration, of course, not just um, the nanomaterial that you're working with, but the other chemicals as well. In terms of PPE, um, wear a lab coat, wear long pants, closed-toed shoes. These are our standard laboratory practices. Okay, medium risk activities. What changes here? Here we really recommend performing work in a laboratory type fume hood, a biosafety cabinet, or power ha powder handling enclosure or an enclosed system. So um, where I would say we've seen the most um, lack of compliance here in academic settings is, for instance, people weighing out materials. Um, NIOSH has done a lot of studies showing that um, you get significant exposure when you're transferring materials both in your breathing zone and also transfer onto you yourself if you're not working in an enclosure. A lot of people don't like to transfer nanomaterials within a standard fume hood because um, the materials tend to go all over the place. And so um, there are commercial options um, that are specifically designed for handling powders and we recommend using those. That really reduces the risk of exposure. Work practices, in addition to the standard chemical laboratory work practices, we might recommend restricting access, posting signs as you would with any other hazardous material, and using anti-static paper and sticky mats to limit tracking. Um, in terms of PPE, um, pretty much the standard recommendations with the exception that now we recommend, um, if possible, to use elastic at the wrists. Um, and to make sure that your gloves cover up over them. Um, there have been some interesting studies out of UMass Lowell where they've actually shown if you have a gap between your lab coat and where your um, glove starts that you get a significant um, dermal um, exposure. Okay, uh, another recommendation that's probably different from what people typically use, wear disposable over-the-shoe over booties and an N95 respirator or respirator fitted with a P100 cartridge. And I just want to point out for those of you who are not used to using respirators, the respirator doesn't have to be one of those big bulky things with the cartridges on it. It could be something as simple as this, um, but you need to be fit tested for it um, by your EHS professional. Um, so this is something that's really a cheap and easy way to provide really good protection, particularly for those of you who do weigh out powders um, and something that we would recommend for everybody. Um, who are doing those activities. Okay, um, for the high risk activities, um, very similar to the medium risk, except for that we're really pushing people to work in an enclosed system if at all possible. So this would be in a custom enclosure for 
um, the operation that's being performed, or um, this is an example of a, um, a glove box that actually has a HEPA filtration system. So it's a little different than a standard chemical um, glove box. Um, same work practices as for medium risk. Um, very similar PPE recommendations with the exception that um, if you're not working with appropriate engineering controls, um, what we would say is that the use of the respirator is required. So you should not be doing things like cleaning out um, um, uh, furnaces with outside of a hood without a respirator present. It's just not recommended. Okay, so some other items that we have in our toolkit um, that I haven't gone over, but there's some of this is on your sheets. Uh, summary of the guidelines for choice of gloves. There's been a number of different glove permeation studies and there's some good guidance on that. Um, some spill response guidelines, again, really focusing on wet cleanup as opposed to dry. Um, and then disposal guidelines by waste stream type. 